So I think that I learned many things today, but one powerful thing that stayed with me is that uh, uh, I have to focus on progress on my language acquisition and concentrate on a task at a time. And I've been in this country for over 20 years, and today's uh, task for me as a non-American is to learn to speak in acronyms. Uh, Italians don't understand acronyms, and I get mixed up all the time when I try, but I'm going to give it a try. I am so delighted to welcome uh, Scott McGuinness. Scott received his PhD from Ohio State University, and he is the academic advisor as well as professor in the Washington Office of uh, the Defense Language Institute, DLI. Um, he's also, he, um, between 1999 and 2003, he also served as the executive director of the National Council of Organization of, and I love one, this one, little, little, okay, less, I try, not quite there, but I'll, I'll improve. Less commonly taught languages uh, at uh, the National Foreign Language Center in College Park, Maryland. Uh, during more than 28 years in the language teaching profession, he has held positions at institutions including the University of Pennsylvania, Middlebury College, and has a decade of experience as a supervisor of the Chinese language programs at the University of Oregon and the University of uh, Maryland. He has published a number of books uh, and uh, book chapters and journal article, articles and reviews on language pedagogy and linguistics for the less commonly taught languages in general, and Chinese and Japanese in particular. Again, as was the case with Michael Gass Geisler I, could, Geisler, Geisler, I could go on and on with, uh, with his impressive biography, but that would uh, just take time away from what we're all looking forward to, which is his talk. So I'm uh, happy to introduce uh, uh, language curricular development, developments uh, through the United States government context and uh, content. Please help me welcome uh, Scott McGuinness. Thank you, Christina, and I want to give a special thanks not only to Christina, but to Miao Han as well for bringing me back to Virginia for only, or more specifically, Charlottesville, Virginia, for the only the third time in the 20 years I've been in DC. It's wonderful to be back. I have some very sort of emotional, personal connections to Charlottesville and UVA. My uh, best friend, classmate from grad school days, uh, graduated from, or, or started his Chinese study actually here at UVA, and he liked it so much he talked one of his sons to go here and graduate from here more recently. Um, I'm now reaching the point that, having been in this profession for long enough, that I frequently find myself feeling more like an historian than a linguist. Um, if I ever really was much of a linguist, I also find myself reaching the point that in about a year and a half, I will have spent more years of my life not teaching Chinese, which is what I started out as originally a Chinese language teacher, more time not teaching Chinese than I have spent teaching Chinese. So, and it seems it was rather fortuitous timing as well for me to be reminded that 10 years ago I did a talk at a conference at Duke University um, on the topic of global challenges in U.S. higher education in early 2003. It's sort of interesting, I'd forgotten about this talk till I pulled it out um, because of what I cite in there. I'm not even quite sure why I opened with this paragraph, but here's what it said. In the 200 some years since Jefferson built his academical village in Charlottesville, but the rest of this is actually, that, that's the coincident part, the rest of this is actually a pretty good lead into what I want to talk about. It may be argued while the status of foreign language instruction in American higher education has remained at best marginal, the demand for the products of that instructional system has only increased, particularly in the months since September of 2001. Without describing the needs for foreign language expertise in the United States too narrowly by merely focusing on those programs producing expertise directly related to national and international security, 
It is unquestionable that such deeds may well serve a major contributory role in justifying continued or enhanced federal support for language and international studies at the federal level. Well, using Michael's terminology, did we get it or not get it in the last 10 years? I'll leave that for you to consider. What I'm going to try to do, as I said, from the perspective of a historian is to sort of give you the 50,000 feet up in the sky picture. I'm going to be talking about a couple aspects of specific quote programs that may be of relevance to you as you embark upon this new institute. But what I'm going to try to do is to give sort of the big picture, the DC perspective, because as I know from actual experience, you may feel you're way out in the middle of nowhere here, but by my estimate, it only took me three and a half hours by a train trip yesterday to get here, so you're not all that far out in the world as you might think you are. I also want to emphasize that I'm trying to address this not only to the faculty and staff that are here, but also the students, because I think it's very important for you to be aware of where you, as an institution, but equally important as students and teachers of language fit into what is a still changing national context. Uh, my, my mentor, even, nearly 20 years after he passed on, Ron Walton always used to said, we're all very good at thinking of ourselves as being part of an institution. We also need to think about ourselves as being part of a field. So your role within the field is very important, whether you are a first year student or a dean of a college, your role is very important. So let me begin by giving a little bit of historical context. I, since I don't get to teach much anymore, I'll do a little quiz. How many of you I'll turn the question around. How have you, many of you, be honest, have not heard of the MLA Ad Hoc Committee on Foreign Languages Report? Have not heard of it? Good, because I would like to let you know a little bit about it, because it, it will in some way inform what you do here at UVA and as well as beyond. Um, as Michael said, we sometimes feel like we're prophets in the wilderness. This is a report that not only has legs, as the chair of the committee said, but consistent with the current uh, rage in video and television, it seems to have taken on almost sort of a zombie mentality. It keeps coming back to haunt us whether we want to or not. This particular report, which was form written by a committee of uh, six of us, uh, was admittedly in response to 9-11 by the Modern Language Association, which uh, formed that committee. But the focus was to be on, from the very beginning, on both MLA initiatives as well as ways in which the MLA could interact with other constituencies, <laughs> academic, NGO, and otherwise. And as very much is the want of an academic organization, the focus was to advocate for an agenda beyond national security, put in the parlance of guns and butter. We couldn't just focus on the guns issues. We needed to be focusing on the butter issues as well, too. I won't go all the way through the report because it's available online at the MLA site, and I'm not going to hit the bottom three bullets there, research, networking, and advocacy, but I am going to spend a few minutes talking about our major recommendations in transforming academic programs because I think some of them are particularly relevant to you as you embark upon the establishment of this institute in terms of what you do as an organization. Front and center for our report was the notion that there was a need for the reform of the status quo, what we called the two-tier system, in which the tenured line literature and linguistics faculty in foreign language departments are basically making many of the decisions for the curriculum in terms of the upper level courses, but it is the instructors, lecturers, and graduate teaching assistants, the non-tenured, non-job secure ones that are teaching in the front lines, in the trenches, the language courses. Um, at some point, and Michael might remember, I guess probably relatively close to the end, this concept of translingual and transcultural competence came out, the notion being that what we're trying to do is, as students and teachers of languages, helping our students and ourselves move between cultures, not staying within our culture, but being able to, as many people have said today, communicate with other members of cultures we are trying to get to know. Um, also, I'm not sure it had to be probably either Heidi or Claire, or both Heidi Burns or Claire Cromsch tend to have these pithy expressions they come up with of content from the beginning and language to the end, which means you don't wait till fourth year language courses to start teaching content. You build in, whether it's through authentic materials or small pieces of literature, you build that in from the beginning, but you don't stop teaching and learning language even when you are in the 
quote unquote fourth year course. Um, talk about extra departmental barriers. This will become very important when I talk about the flagship initiatives. The idea is, is that even if we can't make foreign languages indispensable, or it's hard for us to make the case that a foreign language study is indispensable in a liberal arts education. We need to make ourselves at least more relevant to what is going on across the university. So those extra departmental partners means other colleges, other departments, even ones that we may not have traditionally thought had an interest in foreign languages. Because as I'll be showing you here today, particularly with the flagship, they do. Um, Importance of language acquisition specialists in language departments, both to make the work more effective in the departments for the teachers and the students, and as well just to give greater substance to what is going on. Strengthening demand for language competence within university curricula. Now, to me, the timing was thoroughly unplanned, but just at the point at which the ad hoc committee report was coming on from the academic sector, we also saw in the government something called the National Security Language Initiative, that second bullet. So my second quiz question is, how many of you have not heard of the National Security Language Initiative? That was what I feared because that unfortunately has happened to that. I'm gonna talk more in detail about the language flagship later, but let me talk about the National Security Language Initiative. And again, luck of the draw, this was an initiative within the United States government, but what came out of it was greater partnerships with the academic community. There were three goals of expanding the number of Americans mastering critical need languages and starting at a younger age. So that I was glad to see, in fact, there was somebody here from a high school. When we're talking about what the State Department calls the super hard languages, what we in the Department of Defense called category four languages, Arabic, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Waiting until you are 20 or 21 will make it a very hard row to hoe to reach advanced levels of proficiency, although Professor Laughlin is a case in point that you actually can wait till you're in your teens. Anecdotal information, I didn't start my Chinese till I was 23, and I didn't start my Japanese until I was 28. I won't talk about where I am on Japanese now. My Chinese seems to decline as well, too. So, mastering critical need languages, starting at a younger age, increasing the number of advanced level speakers of foreign languages, and increase the number of foreign language teachers and resources for them. This particularly becomes critical for the less commonly taught languages because the capacity for not only at the higher educational level, but particularly for K through 12 to be able to turn out certified teachers in critical languages is no insult intended, it's hard for foreign colleges and schools of education to provide that sort of training in many cases. This was one of those rare cases where you actually got four departments and a federal agency to at least for the purpose of an announcement play nice together at a podium. This was a, this was a joint initiative of the Department of State, Education and Defense and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence which is basically an overarching office that oversees the 17 separate intelligence agencies within the United States government. Now what happened under Nestle, I guess that's appropriate since it's Halloween, Nestle, like Nestle the candy, so it's the, that's how the acronym is used. Um, each of these different departments was tasked or not assigned per se, but took on responsibility for a set of initiatives or in some cases a single initiative. And part of the reason I wanted to ask you that question had you heard of Nestle is it's a testimony to the fact about how quickly it disappeared from the radar scope in only seven years. So each one of these agencies had a different set of responsibilities or projects they were in charge of, and some of them have fared better than others. For example, the Department of State still has about six or seven initiatives for both students and teachers. And to their credit, they continue to make these programs flourish, but sort of a caveat with that, many of these were initial initiatives that predated Nestle. They already were in place, like the Gilman Scholars Program, some of the Fulbright programs. It's just that it was under the umbrella of Nestle once this was announced. Department of Education didn't fare quite so well. The Department of Education had a single program they were to be responsible for, which is the Foreign Language Assistance Program, which is been around for quite a few decades. It was established for the purpose of starting up programs through state education agencies and local edu education agencies 
for foreign languages in K through 12. Three years ago, it was zero funded. FLAP is gone. FLAP will not be back for all practical intents and purposes. So the one role that education had to play for foreign languages under Nestle is no more. The Department of Defense has fared a little bit better. Some would say it all has to do with having the bigger pocketbook, and there's no question the pocketbook helps. But at present, the Department of Defense has, under the language flagship, 30 domestic um, programs, 10 overseas programs in 10 different languages. And that's what much of what I'll be talking about here are some of the initiatives they're doing for that. Um, the other one that has fared quite well is Star Talk. Uh, through the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, and you are to be commended. I had the great good pleasure of last summer of being a site team visit leader to do the site visit for Zeng Laoshi's program for Star Talk, and you can take due pride uh, in the very good work that is being done here through the Star Talk program. Star Talk, just very quickly, is if you're not familiar with it, it's a combination of teacher training programs and student summer camps. The idea being is to start interest earlier in critical languages. In the case of the teacher programs, it has filled gaps, particularly for Chinese, Russian, and Arabic in teacher training that could not have been otherwise filled in regular <laughs> academic year programs. Um, so that's where we are on these four Nestle programs. I believe Christina was saying she has to maneuver through all the acronyms that go along here. I will walk through this one very slowly. It's important for you to know about these, I think, because it should give some amount of hope to the prospect that even though these are coming out of the Department of Defense, there are some enlightened minds, and I'm not talking about mine. There are some enlightened minds working with some of these programs. How many of you, third trick, not trick question, how many of you heard of the Boren Fellows Program? Okay. Early in the 1990s, uh, former Senator Boren of Oklahoma uh, got legislation through to set up what was called the National Security Education Program. And the idea was to fund both undergraduate and graduate students, including those doing research for dissertations, to countries where critical languages, and critical languages is a moving target, where critical languages were part and parcel of what was necessary for meeting national needs as well as for them to do research on that. The National Security Education Program has a number of components now. One of them is the language flagship, and one of them is the English for heritage language speakers. Two years ago, the National Security Education Program got merged into the office of the Defense Language Office and came up with another tongue twister of an acronym, DELENCIO which is basically two-pronged. It's under the Undersecretary for Readiness in the Department of Defense. The Defense Language Office was to set policy related to all language training in the Department of Defense. That includes everything from Defense Language Institute in Monterey to special operations forces that need language for very specialized purposes for SEALs and other sorts of special operations forces and setting the direction for what the programs were going to look like. The very good news is that whereas DLO had been composed, led by career Defense Department senior executive service, when the office was merged, they poached a fair number of people from the Department of Education. So for example, the director of Delencio is Michael Nugent, who used to be the head of the Fund for the Improvement of Post-Secondary Education, a Department of Education program. His number two is Ed McDermott, who, if any of you worked with Title VI in years past, Ed McDermott was with the Department of Education overseeing language resource centers, national resource centers, the cyber programs, and so on. The third poaching was Ed McDermott's replacement, Sam Eisen, who now receives the language flagship. So my point is, is that it's not just a lot of money that's coming out of, DO, of DOD for programs like the flagship. It is being in the hands of people that have worked in and are specialists in foreign language education and see the ways in which the government and academia can and should work together it can be a very constructive one rather than a confrontational one. And the two cases we're going to see for that 
are the language flagship and the English for heritage language speakers. I'll touch probably only very briefly on the heritage language speakers. I think it's just important for you to see that we're looking at a lot of different languages. My friend Jim Alatus, who many years ran the School of Foreign Service at the Georgetown University, was always quick to point out, to always remember the most widely taught foreign language in the world is English. So we need to be able to look at the experience of English language teaching and learning for building other initiatives as we go. Okay, there are three basic goals for the language flagship, and it's actually pretty simple. Create a pool of college graduates from all majors with professional proficiency, which on the interagency language roundtable scale means three on a scale of five. On the actful scale, which goes with words instead of numbers, actful superior. It's very simple. They have to turn out people at that levels of proficiency, and they will continue to be funding. They're looking to create the next generation of global professionals and to change the expectations for foreign language learning. What this means in plain English is it's not all about training the replacements for our professors. We are not training in a flagship program those that are going to be exclusively literary criticism scholars and linguists. We are training those that have not only language proficiency, and cultural proficiency, but some other vocational proficiency. And let me give you an example from a non, you don't have to do it in a flagship. In fact, you've got products probably coming out from UVA, but I can cite one example. The son of that good friend that I told you about, he graduated from UVA several years ago in a pre-med program. And he is now, in fact, finishing up his residency out in San Francisco. His father had been director of the State Department school over in Taipei for eight years. So he grew up many years, the son did as well, grew up in a Chinese speaking environment. So when he got back here to UVA, he, his Chinese was pretty good, as Sung Lao Shi might remember, pretty, pretty decent. What he was able to do in his pre med program was with his professor, who was in somewhere in the med school, I think, over here, he spent two summers in Sichuan working with that professor doing research on AIDS and then was able to come back, complete his pre-med, and then go on for med school. Now, whether or not he actually goes on to work in greater China in that area of research is in many ways is, is, is impossible to know. But the point is, this is someone that had language expertise, cultural expertise, and was developing vocational expertise while he was still an undergraduate. And that's what's really shifted at the flagship. When the flagship was first established, it was meant to be basically a capstone program a two-year master's that was added onto it. Now what it is in all flagship programs is a four-year undergraduate baccalaureate program for which the focus is you don't just major in language, you're majoring in another field or fields. And for the following, okay, next slide, excuse me. So when you're thinking about building a flagship, some of the considerations are this, and I think we've actually touched on some of this this morning when we were talking about study abroad and the ways in which study abroad interfaces with the foreign language curriculum here at the University of Virginia. You want to reconfigure undergraduate programs with content learning and target language and integration across disciplines. Put another way, you're just wanting to have content-based instruction, not unlike what we've seen for many years in the culture and languages across the curriculum initiatives that have been at some schools like Binghamton since the early 1990s. So you've got the language, but you're, you're learning the language within a content context of a discipline other than pure language. Again, very important for the language flagship is the articulation between domestic overseas programs. Echoing what was said this morning, if you get somebody back from a study abroad program and you're not articulating where when they come back here for a senior year, or put more bluntly, if there's no courses available for them to follow up on their study abroad, you've really had a wasted opportunity for that person, and in a sense, lost opportunity for you as an institution to be better for his or her experience. Um, the flagships go one step beyond that. Not only are you talking about a study abroad component, you're talking about direct enrollment in courses in foreign partner institutions. So Chinese flagship students enroll at Nanjing University at regular courses within the Nanjing University curriculum. That's the ultimate goal that you're wanting to get there now. And then I thank my colleagues over at Delencio. Uh, 
Sam Eisen and uh, Ed McDermott for the data. There was a conference that was held last year uh, on the 10th anniversary of the uh, flagship program uh, that went through some of the data that's been pulled out from these 10 years. Here's some, just some interesting basic figures. About 50% of the current flagship students are enrolled in more than one major, sometimes double majors, sometimes triple majors. So yes, they'll be majoring in the language, but they're going to be in other areas to include in the humanities and business, which is what we would typically expect there to be, but also the social sciences, STEM disciplinary areas. Remember the, uh, the pre-med student I talked about? We're starting to see students that are doing double majors, including engineering, natural sciences, hard sciences, computer science, technology transfer. Among the flagship students, we're seeing, not surprisingly, because this has been around for decades, business or econ or management majors, but again, also in STEM, international affairs, political science. Arabic students are also pursuing double majors, particularly we see in international affairs or political science. And again, completing a language and literature degree along with another major. The numbers you can see, the number of domestic programs and overseas, the, the Chinese domestic programs are going to creep up into double figures sometime early next year because they've just had a request for proposals go out earlier this fall for a 10th Chinese flagship. Not too surprisingly, we would see larger numbers to be expected for Arabic, Chinese, and Russian, but notice they've also added languages such as Portuguese. One flagship, but Portuguese flagship. Now what I want to talk about, these, this goes to what the title of this was, what are the sort of curricular models that have been emerging out of the flagship programs? And again, this is something that might be of interest to you as you continue to move forward with the curricular elements of the Institute. This notion of having distance learning models that are done on a consortial basis. Four of the Chinese flagship institutions have put together what they call Chinese academic language learning modules. Um, interestingly, it's being done among four of the smaller institutions, and the reasons for that will become clear in a moment. San Francisco State, University of Oregon, University of Rhode Island, and Western Kentucky University. The delivery is done in an online environment. One example of a course under this rubric is Journalism, Medium, and Society. Now I want to thank the former director of the flagship and the Language Resource Center out at University of Oregon, Carl Falsgraf, for giving me some background in terms of the design of this particular course. When we talk about content classes, when we get into upper level curriculum, they are essential. But when you're talking about content classes, generally speaking, on a purely local level, they are unsustainable. Why? Because your class size is probably, no matter how big your university is, your class size is going to be smaller. And when you're fighting with registrars to make a case for we really need a class with three people in it, and they say, no, you can't put a course on the books with only three people in it. You've got a certain threshold that you have to have. So content classes are unsustainable purely at a local level because of size. The other issue is local expertise. You may have, as is the case at the University of Oregon, the luck of a draw of a journalism professor who happens to be a native speaker of Chinese and can do content-based instruction. But at many other flagships, you simply don't have that sort of expertise in-house. You may have a medical specialist that would be able to do a content-focused course on research in developing countries related to AIDS or whatever, but not all schools are gonna have that in-house. So you need to pool your resources. The former director, Bob Slater, of the flagship always used to say, once we got up into numbers around eight to 10 for Chinese flagships is, you guys are gonna to have to play nice with each other. You're gonna to have to share. You're gonna to have to share your crayons. Not everybody is gonna get their own study abroad program. We're not gonna have 10 study abroad programs. We're gonna share our resources. And the same principle underlines these new Chinese content courses being developed through Oregon. Um, the other important thing has to do to a more purely curricular design. When we've frequently seen languages across the curriculum or content-based instructions in the past, the focus has seemed to have been just more of piling up vocabulary. So there would be long lists of vocabulary in a content domain, whether it was computer science or engineering or whatever. But remember that we said that the goals of a flagship program is to turn out ILR level three, 
When we talk in the parlance of those levels, an ILR zero is only at the word level. An ILR one is speaking at the sentence level. An ILR two rated person can speak at the paragraph level, and a three should be able to speak at the discourse level. That means they need to speak in connected discourse, not in vocabulary list. And if you want to do the parallel, think if you ever have had a superior actual level speaker in a language, how much language can they produce? Quite a bit, hopefully, if they're rated as a superior. So the content classes that are being developed on this Chinese model are going beyond domain knowledge, going beyond vocabulary knowledge to discourse syntax effectiveness. How can you use speech at the discourse level to be able to communicate your meaning in the target language? So the goals of sustainable content classes in the development of discourse syntax effectiveness. Now, when we look at the strategy, we've already mentioned that you're talking about pooling content expertise from multiple institutions designed for an online environment with flexible delivery options. This is necessary even for this domestic program because you're talking about going across three time zones. So you have to work around different institutions in different settings. If you look at the lower end of flagship programs as they are currently configured, when you talk about the first four levels, the lower levels, for which people may be coming in at different levels, depending on how much Chinese they have before they come in, it's not gonna look all that much different from what you have in place already. It's a Chinese one, Chinese two, Chinese three, Chinese four. What you then get up to is you get up to the higher level courses, you're looking to help develop domain area, vocabulary, content knowledge. So breaking it down into strategies in Chinese for the humanities, for the social sciences and the natural sciences. Then you're talking about advanced topics that are domain specific, be it physics, be it computer science, be it engineering, but you're talking about a team of language and domain specialists that are working in tandem. The Persian has a slightly different model, but this particular model for Chinese are actually team teaching in the classroom setting. So then the content classes, again, if you're lucky enough to have that native speaker of Chinese who's the journalism professor, they're doing it as a content course, and what happens is it gets put into the curriculum at that university, it goes through the regular approval process at the university. And then what you're aiming for is to prep that student or those students for a direct enrollment in a course in the target language country, wherever your overseas experience is going to be. So you're trying to build them up content area to domain specific areas to actually being able to be in the target language environment in the country. So that's one particular model. Um, supporting needs. There are a tremendous amount that go into this as well as lessons learned if you're talking about an online course. You have to orient both students and faculty. You have to provide the cultural background appropriate for that particular domain. There has to be activities that build them up from talking at maybe just still a paragraph level to a multi-paragraph level. You have to confirm that they're comprehending and ultimately what you're wanting to do is for them to demonstrate what they can do in both spoken and written form. The lessons learned, again, thanks to Carl for his insights on this, the online learning expertise is critical. Those of you that have worked in online environments, I don't have to tell you that. It's not a matter of putting a camera in front of a teacher, turning it on, and letting them speak for 45, 50 minutes. The 90s are littered with the carcasses of distance learning programs that made that very, very mistake, that did not train the teachers for what they are doing. Harvesting content, by that I mean how do you get a means of confirming what the students can actually do with the language. It's not just a vocabulary quiz. It's not just a long essay. There have to be different ways in different domains to harvest that content. And come parallel to the online learning expertise, the delivery model is a huge challenge, not just because of the technology, but in terms of how you package it with various components, not just the human interaction, but the other sorts of resources that would be there to support it. So that's one particular model. Very briefly, I'll talk about the Persian model, which is being in the early stages. They too talk about content-based instruction. It's a slightly different sequence in that they do the core language instruction is all front-loaded in the first and second year. Then they have what's called a sheltered content-based instruction in the third year. 
building still in the end, as it was talked about for the Chinese, you want to try to have a content course in the language if you have the expertise on a local campus. They're not, they're not doing this at a distance model, they're doing it all locally and they're doing it all with resources that are available there in College Park. And then your study abroad and direct enrollment in a target language country in the institution. I'm going to skip through the details. If you have questions afterwards, I'd be happy to go back through these slides, but a lot of this is sort of self-evident. You've got to have defined goals. You've got to scaffold at each stage. You've got to prep students as you move up through. The one thing I'll say that's different about this one is that what Persian does looks a little bit more like what some of you may remember when authentic materials first started to be integrated. We talked about pre-listening activities, listening activities, and post-listening activities, pre-reading, reading, and post-listening, post-reading. Well, the same sort of thing is going on with Persian. They're basically doing a pre-task session, but that's being done with the language instructor. And then the content, the actual task, is being done with a discipline specialist who has been trained to do it as a language class, not as a lecture. And then sort of a debrief, review, recap with the language instructor. So it's not so much the direct team teaching, it's team teaching, but it's split between the language specialist and the discipline specialist. Okay, I wanna talk about this English for heritage language speakers because it's one more way in which we're talking about getting language and cultural expertise into the government. Because one of the things that goes along with the flagship program is that if you receive scholarship support for the flagship, you have a service obligation, not necessarily to an intelligence agency, but to work for the federal government for the amount of time equal that you were supported. So if you got two years of scholarship money, you need to give back two years of work in some federal agency. What the EHLS program has been trying to do is there are a large number of either immigrant or heritage speakers of languages that are really critical in our ability to function internationally. And many of them have moved up to sort of like their ceiling in terms of their English language skills, both spoken and written. And if they wanna move farther up within their particular agencies, they need to be able to develop their English skills. They already have the foreign language, and we're gonna see the list of some of the languages that they are coming into this program with, but they need more English language skills for both speaking and writing. And I wanna add just anecdotally, I worked very early on with one of the uh, participants in this program who was native Vietnamese, but also spoke both Chinese Mandarin and Chinese Cantonese. And so she had been work she worked for the our friends, the Internal Revenue Service, and she was doing in a pretty good position, but the problem was she didn't have those sorts of English skills that would enable her to move to a higher level of management within the government service. And those are the sort of people in the government service already that EHS HLS is targeting. It's a scholarship program, full tuition, study in the English language program, the special one set up at Georgetown, and then a one-year federal service requirement. You can see what their days look like that's eight months in which they're basically doing the same sort of things our Monterey students do for 47 or 63 weeks. It's a full day job in studying English. When they get to the fourth part, the last two to three months, they do part-time online study, but what they're engaged in is preparing for a major research paper relevant to a federal agency. What EHLS has been doing is working with federal agencies in terms of what research they need to have done so that they can do their particular job better in an international setting. And so what happens is, is at the end of this program, oh, let me stop right there, you can see the range of languages that are represented there. Some of them are very, very current. Some of them may seem more peripheral at this particular point, but they are all ones for which there is an international need for United States government personnel to have a better handle on what's going on internationally. And if you've got the language and cultural expertise on top of that, all the better. At the end of the program, they have what's called an open source forum and where the participants in that years will present orally the results of the research that they've been doing and then field questions and answers, non-scripted, from subject matter experts in the various federal agencies. And let me just let you take a look at the topics for last year's open source symposium. 
I don't know about you, but I would have trouble doing English language research into these topic areas, and English is, last I looked, my first language. But imagine having to do this with English as your second language to do a significant 10 to 12 page research paper and then field questions on the topic areas. Um, the, the success of this program is still relatively mixed because it's, there aren't a lot of people that have come into it yet, so we're going to have to wait to see what the long-term results will be. Um, but you can see it's, 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 it's a very challenging task that is provided to these young men and women, and some of them are still very young. All right, I want to stop there. I just want to put out, um, save time for questions towards the end. I realize that from, sometimes when we come in from D.C., you feel like you're drinking from the fire hose because there's a lot of acronyms and there's a lot of stuff going on. But I hope that, if nothing else, what I've been able to show you is, is that even while we continue to see resources at a limited degree for foreign languages coming from the federal government, I do feel honestly, and not just because I work for them, but what I've seen in the last 10 years of being a DLI, I feel a whole lot more confident that initiatives like the flagship and initiatives like the EHLS provide the sorts of models for ways in which the government and academia can work together and perhaps even academia to include the University of Virginia someday. Thank you very much.